Welcome to this video made for iGEM 2021 by iGEM team Brno Czech Republic. Um, I'm Martin Flora. I'm sitting here at campus at Masaryk University. Uh, Brno is the city where the Johann Gregor Mender did his experiments, his famous experiments with P. And today we have a special host, Michal Bobek. Uh, please welcome. Um, Michal yeah. Bobek is the general advocate at the Court of Justice of the European Union. And we invited him because he was involved in a pretty uh, important judgment that influenced the uh, future of new genomics techniques uh, and especially CRISPR. And today we would like to talk about, about this topic. So uh, please, Mr. Bobek, uh, could you please at the start uh, shortly introduce yourself and your role at the Court of Justice? Hello, hello, good afternoon. My name is Michal Bobelek. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind invitation. I happen to be still serving for another week and I'm out of the office as one of the Advocate General at the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, An Advocate General is rather a special type of function within the Court of Justice of the European Union. It's somebody who delivers opinions to the Court of Justice in all independence, essentially in and of all cases, but the more complex one wants a sort of a preliminary assessment of the legal matters arriving, arising in a case, plus provides a suggestion to the court how it, he thinks or he or she thinks the court should decide the matter. So from this point of view, uh, especially to the more Anglophone audiences, Advocate General or Attorney General might be a bit misleading from the common law world where it's more understood as the state prosecutor or state counsel here within the Court of Justice in this regard based more the French tradition an Advocate General is essentially a member of the court who is assisting the court by delivering impartial opinions. I did so as well in the case that is of interest to you, uh, called Confédération Paysanne, which was a litigation a few years back concerning uh, the, the, the status of certain genetically modified organisms and their regulatory status under EU law. And equally in that case, which was assigned to me, as well as, of course, then to, or at the same time, to the reporting judge and a grand chamber of the Court of Justice, I provided a so-called opinion, which is a preliminary assessment of the matter, which is written up uh, after a hearing and exchange of pleadings between the parties took place. And there was an oral hearing. Afterwards, I finished my opinion, which was submitted to the court. At the same time, it's actually published officially and to the, to the outside world. And at that moment, the court, back then composed as a grand chamber, started deliberating on the case. So that is, in a nutshell, my role in general and in the specific case. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your introduction. Um, I've read both your statement and the judgment. Um, I've printed it out, and now I like to. I would like to share some documents related to this. Uh, to this judgment, uh, it's uh, especially the uh, Directive 2001-18, am, right? am I right? It's what, it's actually the document that we are talking about in this case. Oh, indeed. I mean, that was the backbone. Of course, um, um, the, re the referring court here, uh, the Council of State, Conseil d'État in France, submitted, if I recall correctly, more questions in total four. Mm -hmm. And um, the key question uh, was indeed the one concerning the directive on the deliberate release into the environment of genetically modified organisms, i.e. the GMO directive from 2001. But there were also other questions concerning other instruments of EU law, in particular plant varieties and some other instruments. But indeed, that was the key document uh, and the provision there, there, there of in need of interpretation in that case. Yes. Uh, now I'm sharing 
uh, this document and I would like to show our, our audience uh, some important articles in this directive. Well, this directive regulates the release of GMOs into the environment. Uh, it defines uh, genetically modified organisms and this definition is also mentioned in another directives or uh, decisions. So it's very important uh, definition. And also uh, this directive mentions exemptions from the regulation. Um, and those exemptions I think are really important because it said that this directive imposed a very strict authorization procedure on genetically modified organisms before they can enter the market. So when some GMO enjoys exemption, it's a huge relief for businesses uh, and companies. When we, uh, when we take a look at which techniques are uh, enjoying this exemption, we see it's uh, mutagenesis and cell fusion. And uh, our main focus is on mutagenesis. This uh, mutagenesis is, from how I understand it, applicable for uh, X-rays and chemical agents that can uh, induce this mutagenesis in uh, the DNA. And precisely those techniques uh, are exempted from this regulation. However, uh, this directive was uh, released in 2001, so it's pretty old. And when the CRISPR came in 2011, the, CRISP, uh, the question came that whether also a CRISPR mutagenesis enjoys this exemption. Am I right? Um, because there's a big difference between X-rays and CRISPR, because X-rays are totally random. However, CRISPR can induce a very specific mutation. So it's called targeted mutagenesis, what CRISPR can do. So the question was whether this specific mutagenesis enjoys the same exemption as random mutagenesis. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Indeed, I, I, I agree with you that you are right. In a nutshell, the problem was simply the following. I mean, the key problem. Um, as you have an old directive adopted in 2001, which provided for certain definitions while it omitted others, okay? And the key question was simply, what's the scope of the mutagenesis, mutagenesis as provided in the annex you just displayed? Because of course, then the annex links back to the definition in 2.2, which is a genetically modified organism, and then links to the exceptions in 3.1, to which the directive does not apply. And of course, it's much more complex than that. But in the end of the day, one arrives at the quintessential choice. So the directive says what's exempted is mutagenesis. But it itself, there is no legislative definition what is to be understood under the notion of mutagenesis. Where do you go next? Okay. My proposition and my suggestion in that case was, well, look, you try to look into the normal conventional understanding of that notion at the moment you are interpreting the instrument. And if it would appear at that moment, um, the consensus was that mutagenesis is certain, uh, certain, um, uh, certain change to the, to, the, to the organism in question, which might involve CRISPR and CAS, then, well, why should those be excluded? And later on, we get to the famous recital 17, which of course, uh, by the court later on, was used as um, a tool of rather limiting the scope of mutagenesis, but that's a different story. So in nutshell, the question was, look, the directive clearly, uh, what is supposed to, the directive clearly applies to transgenesis, okay? There is not really a question about that. The question was how far the mutagenesis exemption in the annex and Article 3.1 really stretches, does it contain or include only the, uh, the, the, the methods which have been uh, known and, as it implied, 
selfishly used, but of course there is a very serious discussion uh, at the moment of the adoption of the directive, or is later progress, can later progress also be included? Yes, yes. And maybe I would stress the point that it was clear from the very beginning that transgenesis, inserting uh, gene into organism, is regulated by this directive. So we are talking, uh, we are focused on here on mutagenesis. Yes, indeed, the, of, course, of course. I would point it just to the audience. And um, as I'm a law student, actually, uh, I appreciate you mentioned the uh, Presidle 17, on which uh, the court based its uh, judgment. So I would now share the screen. Resolution 17, uh, in my understanding, it's not even legally binding, but uh, it can be used for legal interpretation when uh, there is uncertainty about, uh, in this case, the term of mutagenesis. Uh, am, I, am I right? Oh, indeed. The question is, is there a certainty or uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. Because, of course, <laughs> Formally, in EU legislation, just for that matter, actually, also in the national legal systems, there it might be visually arranged a bit differently, but the principle is the same. What is supposed to be legally binding, and of course, then later to be enforced by administrators and the courts, is the text of the law, which is normally the bits which are in articles, paragraphs, and so forth. What normally the further documents which accompany the text of the law, such as at the national level would be various things referred to as travaux préparatoires or the explanatory bills or memoranda which accompany the bill uh, at the national level in the normal parliament or legislative procedure are normally there to assist and explain what was meant, but not in itself binding as such, right? The only specificity within the EU legal order is that these are actually incorporated into the text of the legislative measure as such, here in the form of things which is called a preamble and the individual propositions there are the recitals. And here you just highlighted recital 17, which simply says this directive should not apply to organisms obtained through certain techniques of genetic modification, which have conventionally been used in a number of applications and have a long safety record. So indeed, if you take this proposition and apply it to mutagenesis and to simply the scope of its notion, there is indeed support for what the Grand Chamber of the Court did later of reading it very restrictively or rather restrictively of simply saying the exemption uh, adopted in 2001 was always meant only to apply to those techniques. But of course, that is really where the problem starts. Okay, and not necessarily finishes in a view of the general construction, the sense, the social evolution, and the changes, I mean, the question of how you approach and interpret all the legislation. Because yet again, within the legally binding text, it simply says what's exempt is mutagenesis, full stop, right? Without saying which kinds of. By the way, it doesn't even say what mutagenesis exactly is. There you get into all sorts of discussions which have been already extant at the time um, and have been there all along the long. What is it and how is it defined? Is it defined by outcome or is it defined by process? Okay, is it an outcome-based definition? You have done something in a certain manner or is it a process-based definition? These are the things you are doing and outcome is secondary and will support. And from that unfold all the other questions which are which are connected to that and from this point of view a lot of it was really a bit of an open texture mm, yeah now i even display this uh residual 17. well what what's really interesting for me is that you mentioned in your opinion that even those who basically have written this residual namely the commission and the council that they said that this uh, Recital 17 was even not meant to prevent uh, new genomic techniques uh, to be exempted from deregulation. 
Um, well, that's not really for me to judge here, right? Mm -hmm. but, but, but that's not that one couldn't find it out. Well, it's a question of evidence, but it's rather the question of your own, okay? The role of an interpreter, be it a judge or an advocate general, in my personal opinion, is simply to look at the text and read it in a certain way. And that certain way is conditioned not only what the historical legislator might have meant some 20 or 30 years ago, but in my personal view, it simply is the interpretation of an instrument interpreted in certain circumstances at a given moment, given the social and economic evolution. So from this point of view, uh, I don't think that the court is a slave to the intention of the historical legislator, right? Sure. And by the way, I mean, yet again, if the historical legislator would have wanted something, they would have been most welcome to write it clearly in legislation. I mean, if you have written, or if the legislator would have written in the enforceable articles of the of the of the instrument that mutagenesis means that double point, or mutagenesis techniques which are exempted are these double point, and have listed those that they wanted by by radiation or by chemical agent, that's absolutely fine. Nobody would have questioned that. It's simply a question: this was left open, whether intentionally or not. What was the intention? I don't know. But above all, I don't care. It's not my job to second guess what somebody would have thought 20 or 30 years ago. My job is look at what's written as binding law and interpret it in a reasonable way in current circumstances. The judge, the court says that from the documents it had been presented with, it is obvious that targeted mutagenesis can achieve the same results as transgenesis. And I'm really uh, interested in from who did the court get this expert information? Um, I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the court judgment, which I was not drafting, right? So from this point of view, I mean, I can only say that in the in the case at hand, uh, there has been no expert evidence or no or, or no expert hearing or affidavits and so forth. So from this point of view, it's 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 uh, well, it's difficult for me to comment. Of course, in a case like this, um, there is a lot of uh, factual or scientific knowledge intertwined with the law, right? And um, uh, uh, in such situations, of course. As um, this is a procedure called a request for a preliminary ruling, which is a procedure whereby a national court in a member state requests the interpretation of EU law from this court. And those cases are normally supposed to be a pure matter of law, meaning uh, a certain notion or a certain provision is submitted to the Court of Justice, and what is requested is its interpretation. Within the framework of such request for a preliminary ruling, the court normally does not collect evidence, hear witnesses, hear expert evidence and so forth, because what it is tasked to do is, um, is, is, is to interpret the law, not to apply facts or ascertain facts, sorry, ascertain the facts or ascertain scientific truths or fault. Of course, in such situations, the court then inevitably is in a way not bound but has to rely on the facts as presented by the referring court in the present case the council of state of france that uh, made certain suggestions and make certain affirmations as regard the overall factual framework of the case now um, yeah that's i suppose as much as i can say on your question 2.48 Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, if I understand correctly, uh, the role of the court is to see this problem from more of a law point of view than from uh, the expert law point of view, or and especially when court actually doesn't have. Uh, much uh, resources to be able to uh, have an ex expert expert uh, view view on these problematics. Its main role is to 
decide based on uh, law and uh, take the expert advice or anything just to the necessary extent. Uh, well, uh, sorry, may I ask you perhaps differently? So what you just highlighted, the second point of 48, of paragraph 48 in the judgment, you highlighted it because you say, you think is factually wrong, right? Or scientifically, at, at the level of, of content is a wrong assertion. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I think personally it's debatable. It's, it's yeah. It, yeah, you, you, you <laughs> said right, yes. Okay, okay, fair enough, okay. Uh, and I've read some articles that are questioning the sources where the court uh, actually got uh, got this uh, got this information. But well, I, I understand that's maybe a question for the court and not not for you actually. <laughs> I can explain to you if you were to ask me when I've got information in my opinion. I can hardly speak for the court since I don't take part in the deliberation process. Uh, what I would yet again repeat perhaps is that in such type of cases which uh, do involve a deep factual or scientific assessment, the court then necessarily has to rely on the factual assertions as made by the, by the referring court when presenting the factual and legislative framework as the background to the request for a preliminary ruling sent, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I understand. So uh, when I take a look at the uh, question one, well, this, uh, this answer means that actually all the techniques that were uh, explored by the year 2001 and ongoing years, let's say, that all those techniques are subjected to the, uh, to the, let's say, strict regulation under the 2001-18. Um, am, I, am I right? This is the, yes, this is the result. Actually, it could be read even further because uh, when you look at 54, which then is reproduced in the operative part of the judgment at the end, it doesn't only say, well, it actually doesn't say the techniques which have been used, but it reproduces the text of recital 17. So the second intent of that, oh, if you go back, uh, or yeah, whatever. So no, no, just go down to the operative point. Yes. Yeah. So one, it says, um, uh, modify organisms repeating, blah, 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 blah. Article 3.1 reads in conjunction, blah, 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 blah. Must be interpreted as meaning that only organisms obtained by means of techniques, methods of mutagenesis, which have conventionally been used in a number of applications and have a long safety record are excluded from the scope of the directive. Actually, it doesn't directly refer to chemical agents and or, um, and or um, radiation. It goes even further. It says, having conventionally used, but in addition, have a long safety record, right? So actually, if you were to take it literally, even in those two conventional methods or with regard to those, you would have to establish that they have a long safety record. How would you establish that? It's questionable. What you mentioned before already, of course, uh, the, the side effects of those two methods is, of course, it's indeed correct. They have been conventionally used in a number of applications. However, of course, they are off-target mutations. And in my like understanding, um, you know, no, no, not necessarily always know what it will do. You will only find out after certain applications or after certain time whether there have been any off-target mutations and what those are. Does that mean that this is long safety record? Because if you were reading it very extensively, you might also start questioning those methods which have been there in 2001. Not that they have been not conventionally used, but whether they actually have a number of applications and long safety record, okay? Is anybody supposed to examine that? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Yes. But of course, I mean, you can read it. The, the, the simplest way is to say, translate it as, oh, only chemical agents and radiation. However, when you read it really carefully, what it said there, it could be it could be understood even further or rather when you look at the criteria which are announced there okay conventionally used in a number of applications and have a long safety record 
I would assume then you would have to establish that also for the traditional methods because it doesn't say otherwise. Yes, yes, uh, I understand and actually agree with you. Yeah, we have also a another uh, answers here because the judgment we are talking about was not only uh, about the let's say CRISPR and new genomic techniques, but also the definition of GMOs. And what's for me interesting is that even though the uh, traditional uh, mutagenesis techniques enjoy the uh, exemption from the regulation, they are still GMOs. So that's also an interesting question that some organisms are seen as GMOs, but only some enjoy those exemption. Um, so, yeah. That's... Indeed, that's correct. But that is, is partially simply, I mean, the answer to that is easier because there is a legislative definition of what is a genetically modified organism in 2.2, okay? And in the structure of the directive, um, I think I know on this, uh, the court agreed, I would say, I, I, as far as I recall, with my suggestions also that 2.2 says what genetically modified organism means an organism which, with the exception of human beings, in which the genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating or natural recombination. Okay, so mm -hmm. there is some sort of definition. Of course, one can yet again challenge it or question about it, but there is more to start with. And based on that definition, why well, you have a clarification in 2.2a and 2.2b, only to which comes the exemption in Article 3.1. So in the, in the structure of the directive, it simply says these are GMOs, but some GMOs, even if they are GMOs, are exempted from the legislative or regulatory regime of the directive. I don't see a contradiction there. Right? It's simply a normal legislative technique you might find in a number of other instruments. It's simply saying, well, look, uh, a spade is a spade, but not all spades are regulated by this directive. We only want to regulate some spades. That's not a problem. There is no logical inconsistency because there is mm -hmm. no assumption or there is no necessity that uh, a directive for genetically modified organisms must regulate all genetically modified organisms. It's a choice of legislator what it wants to legislate or regulate. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would move to the to the third question, and that asks, uh, in my understanding, in to which extent the member states can uh, alter the goals of the uh, directive, into which extent they can alter it when implementing it into their uh, national law, because uh, maybe audience doesn't know it. But in the European law, the directive uh, doesn't have to be sometimes implemented in national law uh, exactly how it is written, but member states can choose to alter the text of, of the directive. So could you a bit more elaborate on this, on the result in this, uh, in this specific question? I don't think that the member states could change the content of the directive. What is normally the case is that uh, uh, the directive gives you, as, a, as, as its name sort of implies, gives you the direction or the aims to be achieved in regulation at the national level, and then leaves the choice of the means of achieving it to the member states. Okay? And within that regulatory framework, uh, how things are supposed to work normally is that there is a European directive which within a certain time frame has to be transposed and then implemented by the member state into the national legal order, okay? That tends to be anything in between normally six months to five years based on the complexity of the matter and, 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 and a number of other considerations. And this transposition happens at the, at the national level. So essentially there is a EU directive, which then is, if you will, transcribed, it's transcribed and specified into the national law and then published as a national law in the collections of law. And that's actually what is then being enforced vis-a-vis -vis individuals. The same here, the directive from 2001 was transposed in the member states' uh, legal orders. Now, what question three was essentially driving at is, and in this way, it essentially connects to question one, logically. 
okay? Because it's then the relationship uh, based on the answer one would uh, to provide to question one, connect the answer to question three, because there are two or more options, but essentially um, the question is, does, yeah, does the measure or does the directive uh, regulate uh, mutagenesis and which types of? And based on the answer, yes or no, you get then into the question whether the member states have any regulatory space left to regulate it themselves. And there are simply two options or some options in that. Um, option one, the directive uh, could have been construed as saying, I don't wish to apply to mutagenesis because I don't wish to regulate that matter. And that would be needing the exceptions for mutagenesis, which then would, however, mean in the constitution and division of powers in the European Union that member states remain free to regulate the matter because the union did not exercise its preemption and says and simply said, I don't wish to regulate that. And thereby the inherent sovereignty for the member states to regulate matters not specifically provided for in EU law would be maintained or if you wish reinstated and they could regulate it themselves. Alternatively, the other reading of the mutagenesis exemption would be in the way of saying, well, look, it is actually regulated by the 2001 directive by saying it's safe. In this way, the regulatory space would have been conquered and essentially uh, occupied by EU law measure which wouldn't, which wouldn't re-delegate the question at the national level, but would have simply said, I don't wish to regulate mutagenesis here because I think that the method is safe. Hence, member states, you don't have to regulate it either because we need to have a common market, internal market, in the goods sold as such. And from that point of view, you cannot regulate. So, and that's the connection between question one and three and the question of whether or not member states are allowed to regulate in this area, which is then deeply intertwined and flowing partially from the answer to question one, uh, based on essentially the answer to question one, the answer to question three becomes a certain way. So the option is either uh, essentially the mutagenesis exception was meant as to say, I don't wish to regulate mutagenesis, so member states could do something, or alternatively, I am not regulating uh, by subjecting it into the regime of transgenesis, but I'm doing it because I think this is safe. Hence, I am establishing the common standard for the entire internal market, which then would mean member states cannot regulate. And based, I, I, I understand this might be a bit complex, but simply the practical outcome would be under the first scenario, member states can regulate. Under the second scenario, member states cannot regulate themselves independently mm -hmm. so and you're of the opinion that member states uh, can't can't regulate this directive or can um uh, sorry for, for for me uh for me it was pretty much a question of open space and i would have thought that yes they can regulate so they can regulate and put strict restrictions even on the uh, random mutagenesis techniques. Yes, because yes, in this in logic, the, 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 the space was simply unoccupied by EU law. And can it work the other way around? So can, uh, can member states individually put in the transgenesis techniques into the exemption in their national law? No, they can't, because that is regulated by the NRs, okay? When you, when, you, when you look at 3.1 exemptions, and it simply says, I'm not exempting transgenesis by annex, by virtue of annex 1b. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view there, EU law regulates that matter. This is simply the connection to what happens to metagenesis. Mm -hmm. Is it regulated? Is it not regulated? And if yes, how it's regulated? What is being said with regard to the newer techniques? So let's say I want to market some product and I'm not sure whether it falls within the regulation of 2018, I should look at the judgment and decide based on it, because this strict approach will be used also in my case, and I should be aware of it. And Oh, oh well, indeed, of course. I mean, uh, well, if you are a producer, uh, then, of course, your first point of reference 
will be the member state in which you wish to market, okay, whether you want to bring it onto the internal market, which of course the national legislation of that member state would be your first point of departure because that is where you need to satisfy the marketing conditions. And as I said before, since this is a directive, then of course a number of things uh, have to be fleshed out and might be slightly different in a member state, depending on how it was transposed. That being said, of course, all the member states are bound by both the directive, which is the which was the sample or muster for the national legislations, but also by the interpretation of its content by the Court of Justice. And of course, you are right in saying that that interpretation uh, has been rather far reaching and strict. Well, maybe uh, I would take a bit look into the future because recently, uh, in April this year, the European Commission released a study of regulation of new mutagenesis techniques. And there's also a list of terms that are covered with uncertainty. So, as uh, as you said, conventionally used in number of application or so safe line, uh, long safety record. This is regarded by the European Commission as uh, as uncertain term or altered alternation. So now uh, it will be discussed at the European level uh, how GMOs should be regulated. Maybe my question would be: As the European Commission is the main European body who can. Uh, issue a new legal document, why they did not uh, change the directive earlier in 2010 or when the CRISPR, this CRISPR came into existence, why just they could easily change it, not, not easily, but they could change it, or this problem of vague definition of mutagenesis could be prevented. I don't think it's uh, appropriate for me to comment on uh, commission legislative proposals. Quite frankly, I didn't have the privilege of reading the commission report you are now quoting, so I actually don't know the content. In general, I would just suggest the following. I very much understand that um, commission does have an extremely difficult task in trying to suggest any new legislation or amendment to the legislation in this field to the 2001 uh, directive. Uh, which is simply for the reason that uh, there is a very considerable discrepancy and divergence in views and approaches amongst the member states of the Union. And um, by the way, in this case, in the Confederation Paysanne, but also in other cases which concern GMO or novel foodstuffs or novel food additives or vitamins and whatsoever, one sees a uh, strikingly opposing views between various member states as regards precisely, I mean, experimentation, precautionary principle, new methods, alterations, and so forth. And there is no disguising that um, there are some member states which are rather open to these new things and trends in biotechnology and others, whereas there are others which are extremely cautious and adverse. And within such a context, I, I'm afraid uh, that the Commission has absolutely no easy job of trying to square a circle and try to propose and suggest a legal framework for the internal market that would at least, I, I, I wouldn't say satisfy everybody because that's impossible, but at least to be acceptable to everybody around the table. And from this point of view, I really wouldn't reproach Commission on this account uh, because it's extremely difficult, painful, and it's likely to take some time. Yes, I understand that the topic of GMO is very controversial for... I mean, part cases. of the solution could have been, and it was also the consideration which I've put in my opinion and explained there, is of course Partially, a solution to that would be the proceduralization of the problem and the redelegation back at the national level. Okay, if we cannot agree on something at the European level, why could then the member states not retake some part of that power? Of course, that's very, in a systemic terms, it's, it, it might be problematic, and of course, thereby, 
it would need to a certain renationalization of the internal market in certain matters, which of course is problematic. But on the other hand, the legislation in this area has done exactly the same in 2015, when certain matters started to be redelegating back at the national level. So yet again, it's a question of vision and, and, and potential compromise in the area. Yes, yes. Well, maybe as my last question, um, we talked a lot about the law regarding uh, molecular biology, basically. Um, and I think this is very uh, unusual connection for most people. Um, I would like to ask you, for you, what's the connection between the law and biology and how the relationship between those two should work? the research in biology and biotech generally, and the law and regulation? Well, ideally synergy, but I'm afraid I'm unable to answer to such a question at such a level of abstraction, okay? Because, of course, uh, uh, well, on the other hand, there are, of course, uh, you might be perhaps shocked by, shocked by Confederation Paysanne, and the matters which are being brought before a court. Uh, but I can assure you this court, as well as a number of national courts, are increasingly being faced with a deeply technical matters, ranging from GMOs to novel foodstuffs to, uh, I don't know, authorization for atomic power plants down to God knows what, right? So from this point of view, it's part of the job to simply try to to, to turn your head around something and try to understand what is going on and why. Of course, you are not there to replace a second guess or whatsoever do on the level of science. No, you are there to look at the law, which is a slightly different, different, different exercise, right? Um, of course, while doing so, one should acquaint oneself with the basic notions which are there. It's a necessary must in order not to get certain things blatantly wrong. But in the end of the day, you are there interpreting the law. You are not there writing or rewriting any laws of the nature or saying what to, in the end of the day, what factually mutagenesis or transgenesis or whatsoever or GMO is. No, you are simply looking at the law and the regulation, which is slightly different game. I mean, what their relationship should be. Look, <laughs> uh, normative system is governed, of course, uh, by some normative systems, such as law or, for that matter, philosophy, morality, economics, whatever you like. It's governed by slightly different rules than our exact sciences, right? So, of course, law as a normative set of ideas which is being put in cooperation in order to prescriptively govern the behavior of the society doesn't necessarily have to very closely stay to the nature point of view of copying the rules of the nature and then just prescribing them into law. By nature, I mean also parts of economic behavior, human behavior, and so forth. So what I'm trying to say, sometimes by legal regulation, you are trying to twist and tweak the reality, right? So sometimes law is precisely there in order to make people, companies, or environment behave in a certain way, perhaps changing the environment to a certain way. That's logical. That's the aim of legal reg regulation. I'm not enacting the laws in order to say, this is like it is, and it will be like that forever. No, I'm enacting the laws in order to say, this is how it should be, and this is how I want the society and the actors to behave. So there is this inherent normativity, which necessarily doesn't have to copy the factual state of affairs. That being said, of course, once one crosses over into exact sciences, sciences and the regulation of that matter, then of course, <laughs> I mean, what comes often to mind is, is a famous quote of Richard Feynman's, uh, which if I recall correctly, he wrote at the very end of a of a report uh, of the explosion to Challenger 2, okay? It was back in, was it 80s, early 80s? Um, when few seconds in, 60 or 70 seconds into the launch of one of the Challenger uh, missile, uh, Challenger rockets, it exploded, okay? And Richard Feynman, shortly after, before retirement, 
was asked to write a report on the on the on the explosion or simply reliability of the shuttle. And I remember, and I will be you now paraphrasing, but what he wrote somewhere um, towards the end is, 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 is simply that, well, look, I mean, science, uh, uh, well, you cannot fool nature or you cannot fool the science by public relations, right? So reality must take precedence over public relations. And from this point of view, partially, I think also partially applicable to the relationship between science and the rule. Uh, you can try to twist and tweak, but you can hardly change the laws of nature by the law. The nature cannot be fooled here, all right? So from this point of view, I'm afraid I'm not providing a very coherent answer to your question. But as I said at the beginning, I mean, at such a level of abstraction, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's more of a topic for dissertation, but not really a one-liner, right? So, of course, you can influence and change a number of things, but there is equally a number of things uh, on the scientific realm which you cannot change and enter by law. And uh, if you try to or you disregard them, then I'm afraid you are in for a bit of a rough ride because, yeah, they are different laws. Yes, definitely. Well, I think this is a great ending. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I would like to also appreciate how you could dive into the biology in your state, uh, in your opinion. And it's really amazing how you understand those biology mechanics in your opinion for me, as you are a lawyer and you could you, you I, I try to, it. whether I understood them, well, it's a different matter, it's for somebody else to say. I mean, of course, these are rather fiendishly difficult topics where you try to scrap for as much guidance as you can in order to understand what on earth is going on, okay? So, I, and of course, there is the danger of getting it, of getting it blatantly wrong because, yeah, there is only that many hours in a day. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Um, I wish you a nice day and yeah. So bye. Perfect. It has been a pleasure. <laughs>